Good morning. Good morning. And again, happy Father's Day. I have always tried to avoid the Father's Day message or the Mother's Day message. When I was in Las Cruces as the minister there, it came to be Father's Day and I gave this canned talk. Bless our fathers, bless our fathers, bless our fathers. And a woman said in the middle of my talk, you know, not everybody loved their fathers or their mothers. My father abandoned me, she said. He destroyed my life. He was a drunkard, he was a drug addict, he was in prison. So when you say Happy Father's Day, I can't relate to it. And it shocked me. I guess it shocked everybody else too. And I stopped and I said, you know what? I was giving you a canned speech because I didn't know how to do anything other at this time. So I made it sound real nicey, but I'm going to tell you I appreciate you being honest with me because I hated my father. My father was a racist. My father was antisocial. My father was always blaming, criticizing, condemning people, and me, and my brothers, and my sister, and my mother. He was an abuser. So I have to, again, thank you for being honest, because maybe there's so many out there that feel that same way. I've learned to forgive my father over the years, and I really have, because I got to understand him better and I understood him in the last 30 days of his life. I was down in Mississippi on the Gulf Coast the last few weeks of his life. And that's the only time we really <clears throat> had a real conversation. And he told me, he said, you know, I've always hated my father. He told me. And he said, I found out that my father hated his father. And I looked at him and I said, well, then you know how I feel. I said, I, I hated you. I was run away from home at 15. I said, I, I, I've always hated you. You've always been a racist, an outright racist. And you either hated the Jacks because of the war or the Blacks because of what they were, who these people were, and, and, and who do they think they are. I said, you know, my brother believed you. Look at him now. My brother was a, a wreck, an alcoholic wreck. And I said, so that's why I had to get away from you. And he cried. The first time I ever saw that man cry. It wasn't the first time he saw me cry because we used to get the belt. And... But you know there's no victims. And I've grown to learn that we choose our parents, yeah. If you hear me, you know, we live lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. We reincarnate. And we get to choose our parents. And when I got to understand that, I guess I never completely understood that. But why would I have picked my parents? It's because of who I am today. I compare myself to the self that was prior to until now, and I'm proud of myself. We can't see it in each other because we don't know our past. We haven't been there. But I've forgiven him. But not by myself. I tried. Ever since I came into you, I tried to forgive them. And someone said, you're trying to, I said, I'm trying to forgive my parents. You're trying. Well, don't you know you can't do it? Don't you know that by yourself you can't do it? You don't have the power to do that. And unless you partner with God or your higher self or Jesus or the Christ, form a partnership and say, I need help. I cannot do this by myself. I can do nothing. And then ask for help and forgiveness. And so much will be revealed to you. So I got on a binge of forgiveness talks to forgive ourselves, first of all. And that's the hardest thing. 
I can look at my past and I can look at my, my time in military and law enforcement and, uh, and there's things that I, I haunt me at night if I think about them, if I don't release them. So I've learned to say to my ego, and that's all ego, all this stuff, to get, like Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He was saying, get thee behind me, ego, be gone. Substitute a thought. Nate was always good at substituting a thought when he came upon something. And we would say, substitute whenever a negative thought came in mind. Natalie and I used pivot. And Mom used pivot. So when, uh, we get on a and I get on those tyrants one time, tyrants, and, 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 and mad at something or somebody or what have you. And one of Mom, Mom or Natalie would say, pivot. In other words, choose a different thought. And not so, not so easy. So what we're about here in unity is raising consciousness hours <clears throat> and of course anyone who wants to come along on the, on the trip. And I'm looking at every one of you and I know all of you are on that trip of, of open-mindedness and learning to forgive ourselves and everybody else in order to move forward. So when, I think I'm going to go, uh, film more. So this is a dedication of covenant, and, and when we got into unity, we all heard it. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, they, they worked together to try to raise their own consciousness, and they had to make a dedication in the covenant to spirit, and to dedicate and consecrate their lives, and it says here, we, Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, husband and wife, hereby dedicate ourselves, our time, our money, all we have and all we expect to have to the spirit of truth. And through it, to the Society of Silent Unity. It being understood and agreed that the said spirit of truth shall render unto us an equivalent for this dedication in peace of mind, health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and an abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without our making any of these things the object of our existence in the presence of the conscious mind of Christ Jesus the seventh day of May, 1890. Day of December, 1892. And so, what, uh, what I've learned is that to form this partnership with the God of our understanding, whether it's God or Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad, or whatever it is, to form a partnership, and know that by ourselves we can't do it, that we want a partnership to be able to grow, to be able to get through this life. So often, we hear, well, well, you know, God is good, and if God is so good, why am I living this life? Why are there wars? Why is there mayhem? Why is there all this stuff going on in the world? And uh, Jesus said, be, uh, be of it, but not in it. In it, but not of it, excuse me. In it, but not of it. So the thing is to establish the best way we can peace within our own hearts and minds, to connect our minds and our hearts. And, uh, so anyway, the forgiveness is the key, unconditional love, unconditional non-judgment is the key, what have you. I want to, uh, what is that healing thing then? Healing isn't about changing who you are, it's about changing your relationship to who you are. A fundamental part of that is honoring how you feel and oh, how true that is. So. The first relationship you have to have, the first partnership, is with yourself, with your higher self. And uh, I fully believe that we are not all here. None of you are all the way here because that we, are, we are powerful, multi-dimensional beings and we exist in another higher dimension. You can call it heaven, you can call it whatever, it is, but there's a bigger part of us than what's here. And so it's what we're trying to do, our purpose, is to merge our little lower selves with our higher selves. And it's about asking, not even seeking answer. This is what your intention is, set your intention to connect. I want to connect with my higher self. I want to become aware of my higher self. Yeah, I'm told God is within me. I want to connect on a conscious level with that higher self. And that's my prayer. And I want it so bad because it said if you want it bad enough, and only if you want it bad enough, only if you're willing to dedicate and consecrate your life, past, present, future, body, mind, soul, spirit, all it is, 
overcoming this particular consciousness that we're in now. You know, said, Jesus said, all these things I do, you can do also, but not in our present consciousness. Maybe some of you are there. I'm not there yet. We have to shift our consciousness. And when Jesus said, you believe whatever you can believe you can achieve, and these things I do, I remember asking a person one time of a Protestant faith, I said, what did Jesus mean when he said, these things I do, you also can do? And you know what she said? She said, well, I don't really think he meant that. I said, my God, that's the most important thing in heaven. Because we're allowed to change our own lives by, by our own intuition, by our own initiative, by our own dedication and covenant. We can shift our lives. And I brought up the fact that the, the, the monks, how they can, uh, uh, what they can do, some of them can, can levitate, some of them can put up ice, stand on an ice bank and put a blanket around them, wet blanket, and then melt the ice underneath them with the, the consciousness. And I didn't know where I was going to go today with this because I, 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 I couldn't give you a real Father's Day. But then I found a video by Greg Braden. And my goodness, it played right into where I would like to go today. And I can't say it anywhere near than what he can say. So if you Greg Brady, I'd like to welcome you to this very special presentation of Missing Links, the deep truth of our origin, history, destiny, and fate. In our last episode, we discovered how the mysterious genetic fusion of DNA endows us with its extraordinary potential. And we also discovered that we can awaken this potential when we choose, when we want, on demand. Well, in this episode, I'd like to explore two of those abilities, two of those potentials, super learning and deep intuition, as well as the technique that we use to awaken these things in our lives. I'm going to invite you to look at your screen right now, and I'm going to talk about brain states just for a moment. What you're seeing on your screen are the traditional brain states at the very bottom of the screen, the delta waves, long, slow waves, and, and these are when we're deeply asleep, and then the theta waves when we become drowsy, uh, the alpha waves where we're more relaxed and um, maybe in meditation, the beta waves, this is where maybe you are right now when we're busily engaged in daily activities, this used to be the end of the brain states, but there is another brain state that scientists are working with now, and it is above the beta wave. It is called gamma. This is the gamma state, and look at how much faster and how much more compressed these brain waves are. Well, interestingly, these are the brain waves that the Tibetan monks were creating in their bodies intentionally on demand to accomplish the amazing feats of healing, of awareness, of intuition. They're able to regulate their body functions, their body temperatures, their immune response, their anti-aging hormones, all on demand when they choose. This is where they find their power by realizing this potential. So I'm sharing this with you now because, interestingly and perhaps not surprisingly, it is by harmonizing the heart and the brain that we achieve this gamma state. Or one of the ways that we can achieve it, that we achieve this gamma state intentionally. And when we create the gamma state, one of the first things that scientists say to us is it opens the door to precisely what we've been talking about, to states of deep intuition. Uh, it opens the door to increased focus, where we can recall everything about any memorable event. This sounds like some of the very popular television programs where individuals are trained to become superhumans and they walk into a room and boom, they know everything about everyone in that room. Total recall. The gamma state is what allows us very fast processing of uh, storage of information and retrieval. And it actually makes a lot of sense that we would be able to do that. When you think about fast information retrieval and involving the heart. If you really think about it, this makes tremendous sense for this reason. When we process information solely in the brain, 
when you ask your brain a question, the answers generally are a little slower. As I mentioned before, in the heart, they're all, boom, almost instantaneously. Often we answer, uh, ask our heart a question and answers before we finish asking the question. And the reason makes a lot of sense is because the brain, before it gives us the answer, goes through all of the loops of the logic, the fears, the uh, issues of, uh, that have come up in the past, the issues of self-doubt, the issues of self-esteem, all of those things, those are the logic loops the brain goes through, the filters, before it gives us an answer. Heart doesn't do that. Heart, you ask the heart a question, boom, it gives you the answer. Part of my heritage uh, is Native American, is Cherokee. And in the Cherokee tradition, as well as in some others in the Midwest of uh, the United States, our indigenous ancestors knew of this power of the heart, and they actually gave it a name. And this is one of the things, there is no English translation specifically for this name. There is no single English word that means precisely what the native words mean. So we have to create English words around it. Like prana. When we say the word prana, that is a Sanskrit word, there is no English word that means prana. So we have to create some other words. We say uh, energy body or life force to approximate what it means. Well, same things happen with the wisdom of the heart. And the, the word that's used is called shante ishta. Shante ishta. And it means the single eye of the heart. The heart that doesn't judge right, wrong, good, bad. The heart can discern what's true for us and what's not. Yet it does not assign a judgment. That's a powerful distinction. And that will empower you in situations whether you're in the boardroom or the classroom or you're with your friends or in the most intimate relationships with those that are closest to you where you tap and they know you well enough to tap the buttons and the triggers that elicit responses that sometimes you wish you hadn't said. If you can get out of your brain, go into your heart. Shanta Ishta, the single eye of the heart, it'll tell you what's true for you. And you only can't tell you what's true for someone else. And it will do it with the same. So it makes a lot of sense that the gamma state actually allows us this very, very fast process. And the gamma state also, when we achieve that, it's a natural antidepressant. People are happy and they're much calmer when they're in this gamma state. And it also awakens, it breathes life into our sensory perception. When we're in the gamma state, we can pick up scents that we cannot pick up typically in the beta state. We smell things, it becomes alive. Your sensations of sound, music feels differently. It doesn't just sound, it feels differently to you. And these are all the benefits of being in the gamma state. So I'm saying this to you now because we're about to move into the gamma state. Now I want you to know all the benefits that come from doing precisely this. So we've explored many of the potentials that come from awakening this marriage, this union between the heart and the brain. And there are others, we're just barely scratching the surface. But what I'd like to do now is share with you a technique, a technique so that you can tap these potentials in your life when you choose to do so. What scientists know is that every moment of every day, as I mentioned, there's this conversation. It's a conversation between the heart and the brain. The heart is speaking to the brain, and the quality of the conversation that comes from the heart and the brain tells the brain what chemistry to release into the body. So for example, when we're feeling emotions that we would typically consider negative, uh, and I don't like to uh, characterize emotions as negative or positive, but I'm doing this so you can get a sense of what we're doing here. When we have emotions such as anger, hate, jealousy, rage, what you're seeing on your screen is an actual printout of the quality of the signal from the heart to the brain. And you can see it's very chaotic, it's a very jagged signal, it's a rough signal, and it's that chaotic, jagged, rough signal that signals chaotic chemistry in your brain. This is the kind of chemistry that tells us that we need high amounts of adrenaline, high amounts of cortisol, the stress hormones, to respond to something quickly in life. That's a good thing for a few moments. You don't want to live your life day in and day out like this. The next image that you're seeing is what happens when we can shift 
our heart-based experiences from things like frustration, anger, hate, jealousy, and rage, to things like compassion, care for anything, gratitude for anything, appreciation for anything. And when we can do that, very, very quickly, this signal from the heart to the brain shifts, and you're seeing it becomes a, a very rhythmic, very even, very coherent signal. This is what it's called. And it sends a different signal to our brain, and our brain begins to release a different chemistry into our bodies. Now, I'm saying this to you now because I want you to know that your brain cannot do both things at the same time. It can only do one or the other. So when you are in co coherent feeling, in that even rhythm, that's what awakens your brain to send powerful healing chemistry, powerful immune response, powerful anti-aging hormones, awakens your senses, turns on the gamma. Okay, and when you are in the rough, jagged signal, that's fight or flight, your body and your brain are saying, something important is happening, we've got to run or fight, so we don't have time for healing, we don't have time for an immune response, we don't have time for anti-aging hormones, they're not important. So it shuts off those functions in preferential treatment of this fight or flight. So for this reason, you can see why fight or flight is good momentarily, don't want, don't want long term. We can shift these brain states very, very quickly. And what I'd like to do now is I'm going to share a technique with you to help to do this. We can measure this conversation between the heart and the brain electrically. Uh, and it is a very low frequency. So this isn't an esoteric uh, essence of a prana or aura. This is an electrical and a magnetic frequency. And the electrical part is a very, very low frequency. It is 0.1 hertz. It's not even one. 0.1 hertz. This is such a low frequency, you can't even hear this. It is right on the threshold between feeling and hearing. It's a frequency that whales use to communicate in the oceans. So it's, it's a very universal frequency. It's also a frequency that military submarines use to communicate in the oceans, which is why it's a problem for the whales when they use it. And it is the optimal signal to harmonize your heart and your brain. So what this means is if you can create a feeling in your heart of 0 0.1 hertz, then that feeling is going to harmonize your heart and your brain. Now, in indigenous traditions that I've been with, they have techniques to do this. The Institute of Heart Math that I mentioned in the last episode, they have refined these techniques in the laboratory into very, very simple steps that make them accessible in our everyday environment, whether we're in an urban environment, whether we're in a military environment, a first responder environment. Uh, this technique is being used in all these environments that, that I'm mentioning now. Uh, in family and marriage, marriage and family counseling environments, in uh, cardiac environments to help deal with uh, blood pressure and, and cardiac events that are happening within our bodies. So there are a vast and myriad number of applications for the one technique that we're going to do right now. And this technique is the doorway for all the potentials that we've just listed. By achieving heart-brain coherence, it opens the door and we get to choose. It's like once we're in this place, now we can do this, 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 or this. We can be subconscious, we can go into intuition, we can simply use this technique before we go to bed at night to begin to sleep and trigger a healing within our bodies. We can do it first thing in the morning, we can do it before our yoga, we can do it before our martial arts, we can do it before our qigong, our healing practice, any of these things because everything goes better with heart, brain, coherence. That's all we're doing is we're optimizing the conversation between the heart and the brain, between your heart and your brain. So, how do we do this? Three steps. The first step is to simply shift your awareness from your mind into your heart. And what I found is in the Western traditions for many people, that's easier said than done. I'll ask people, are you in your heart? And say, yep, I'm in my heart. But what they are really doing is they're still in their brain thinking about what it would be like if they're in their heart. This is where the indigenous traditions come in. Our ancestors told us, and when I spend time with my indigenous friends, I say, how do you guys do this? And they say, it helps if you can gently touch your heart center, physically, in a way that's comfortable for you. 
In the Mayan traditions, you see a, an open palm right in the heart. In many of the Middle Eastern traditions, you can see the same thing. Uh, in the Buddhist traditions, you see a prayer mudra that physically touches the sternum. The key is, any of those things creates a gentle touch, a physical sensation, right over the heart center. And your awareness will always go to the place where you feel the sensation. That's the key. So if you can create a touch over your heart, your awareness will go there. First step. Second step. Very simple. Slow your breathing. A little bit slower than typical. Maybe five seconds inhale. Five seconds exhale. Here's why that's powerful. Because the only time you would ever slow your breathing and breathe in that way is when you feel safe. When you feel that you're in a place that's safe, that you're not threatened, and you're not vigilant in your surroundings. So you're telling your body you're in a place that's safe. Slow your breathing. Third step, and this is the key, is to begin to feel the feeling that creates 0.1 hertz. Feel the feeling that sets up the coherence between your heart and your brain. How do you do that? I gave it away earlier, I've already mentioned it. Scientists have found at the Institute of Heart Math, their researchers have found that there are four key words that work almost 100% of the time for everyone. Appreciation for anything or anyone. Gratitude for anything or anyone. Care and compassion. If you can feel one or some combination of those feelings in your heart while you're breathing as if your breath is coming from your heart, touching your heart center, now you're setting up this communication between heart and brain. Now you are triggering those neurons to begin to reach out and find other neurons to strengthen this connection. And that's why I mentioned before, it takes about 72 hours, three days to build these networks. So that means the more you do what we're about to do right now, the stronger this connection becomes in your life. Let's try this. Let's go through this together. And this is the way we're going to close out our segment today. I'm going to invite you first to shift your awareness from your mind into your heart by gently touching your heart center. And once you're there, breathe a little slower than you typically would. Five seconds inhale. Five seconds exhale. As you breathe, feel your breath coming from your heart and begin to feel those feelings. Passion, gratitude, care, appreciation. To the best of your ability. To the best of your ability. And then we'll do the same. researchers have found is that typically three minutes, only three minutes of doing what we have just done will set into motion a cascade of events within your body, biochemical events that will last as long as six hours. The immune response, the SIGA response, first line immune in the white blood cells of your mouth, they are reflecting this effect for up to six hours after you actually create the experience. So, I mentioned that we can do this any time of day. You can do it before you sleep at night, first thing when you wake up in the morning. This technique, as simple as it seems, is the powerful key to awaken the greatest potential in your life. Simple technique that we have just experienced. It is the key to our personal power and to the doorway of all the abilities considered rare and mystical in the past. We don't have to go to a monastery halfway around the world to learn it. In our next episode, we're going to discover how this very technique is also the key to trigger the self-healing within your body that leads to an extended lifespan well beyond what's traditionally accepted today. So I want to thank you for joining me for this very powerful episode, and be sure to tune in for our next all-new episode of Missing Links, the deep truth of our origin, history, destiny.
and we went up to Greg, Greg Blayton's house up in Question, New Mexico, in the 80s sometime. You know, he's a, he's certainly a profound individual. And so the key for me to forgiving my father and my mother, but talking to my father, was compassion. I had to have compassion for where he was. I told the story of my mother, you know, she went through that. My father went through this with a with a father that was very hateful, very dogmatic, and very critical of everything he did. And, and, and I had to get into that space and then I could relate it to my space and say, oh, that's how he felt. I could feel that. And I was able to to forgive him. And that's why in the last days of his life we were there. So the idea is compassion. You've got to start now with compassion for yourself. Love yourself enough to want to grow beyond this stuff down here. To find peace in your heart. And I try every day. Mom and dad and I, we work together to bring peace about in our hearts and our minds. And it's uh, simple, but it certainly is not easy. So we uh, love you.